for sticking in with us this morning. Uh, my name is Nancy Link. I'm from Community Health Partners for Sustainability, and I'd like to introduce Anna Gard, who's going to talk about understanding the key elements of effective clinical decision support, building an asthma clinical decision support tool. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have maybe five people in the room, and I'm not sure everybody was planning on being here, but if you are, I'd ask you to come a little closer so I don't feel like I'm speaking to an empty room. Um, my name is Anna Gard. I'm a family nurse practitioner, and I practice at a nurse-managed health center right outside of Philadelphia. It's a small children's clinic by the uh, VNA Community Health Services. We are a level three patient-centered medical home. And I am also the health IT and quality consultant for the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, which is a national advocacy organization uh, that represents uh, all disciplines of healthcare providers who are working in safety net communities. And today I'm going to talk about key elements of asthma clinical decision support to improve comprehensive asthma management. I'm going to share with you a project. This is um, funded from a uh, indoor air quality division EPA grant, and it is a collaboration with my organization, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, and the Alliance of Chicago Community Health Services, which is a health center control network in Chicago. And the purpose of this project is to develop a comprehensive uh, asthma management electronic clinical decision support tool to improve adherence to asthma guidelines as well as improved uh, outcome of uh, our patients in the care of their asthma. So this quote, and I'm not sure why the slide actually got cut off, but um, the quote from the American Lung Association, if you can't breathe, nothing matters. And we know, uh, and I know there's been multiple sessions today um, over the last week on asthma, that when uh, asthma is poorly managed, its impact is felt community-wide. It increases healthcare costs, lost school days, lost time from work, and most importantly, importantly needed illness at um, needless illness and at times death. According to 2010 CDC uh, statistics, there are more than 29 million adults who have been diagnosed with asthma. 7 million uh, or 10 million children, excuse me, have had asthma in their lifetime. And the rates of asthma are rising, not falling. From 2001 to 2010, the proportion of people with asthma has increased by almost 15%. We know that children have a higher uh, incidence of asthma prevalence than adults. Asthma prevalence is highest in Puerto Ricans, followed by African Americans, Native Americans, and Native Alaskans. The lower incidence is in Caucasians, less in Asians, and the lowest incidence of asthma is in Mexicans. And those with family income below the federal poverty level have a higher current asthma prevalence than those above the federal poverty level. And we know that persons living in poverty are more than likely to use the emergency department for care, lack a primary care provider, live in substandard housing that places them at substantial risk for asthma due to in increasing exposure to asthma triggers. If you look at this chart here, uh, it's a, a study that shows in 2013, the states across the, uh, the United States, the uh, amount of uh, hourly minimum wage needed to afford rent. So if you look uh, in um, the area where you may live, and you can see that the lighter states, you have to work 80 hours a week or less in order to afford the minimum range of, of rent. Uh, and at the highest or the darkest levels, so for example, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, California, uh, you'll need to work 98 hours a week or more in order to afford healthy housing. This study estimates that workers would need to make at least $18.79 an hour in order to keep rent from eating up more than 30% of their income. Yet the average renter actually actually only makes an hourly wage of $14.32, and most make much less than that. 
So <clears throat> almost two years ago, there was a federal action plan to reduce racial and ethnic disparities that was drafted. And this is a joint uh, effort between Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services, and the EPA to look at uh, an action plan to reduce asthma disparities. And they came up with four strategies. One is to reduce barriers to implementation of guidelines-based care. And so we want to ensure that um, the health centers and healthcare providers who are treating patients with asthma are following the most recent asthma guidelines that were released in 2007 by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Despite the fact that those guidelines were released in 2007, we are still not seeing an improvement in asthma incidence, and as I mentioned, we've seen an increase of up to 15% in asthma morbidity and mortality. So despite there being new guidelines, we have found traditionally that it takes at least five years for primary care providers to adopt into practice recent guidelines. Some specialty practices do adopt it sooner, but uh, it's 2013, so it's been six years, and we're still not seeing complete adherence to the uh, evidence-based guidelines to treat asthma. The second strategy is to enhance capacity to deliver integrated comprehensive care, and that means how are we even um, providing access for patients with asthma to uh, be treated. And so we um, talked a little bit yesterday in one of my sessions, and I know there have been other sessions, about the development of the medical home model within health centers, is creating a medical home for our patients so that they can receive comprehensive asthma treatment, which is beyond just being treated when they're having asthma exacerbations, but also having resources and supports for environmental trigger for community health workers to help with home assessments. Um, and so really working in developing that medical home model to provide comprehensive asthma care. The third strategy is to improve capacity to identify children most impacted by asthma disparities. And we know that children, particularly in poverty in urban regions, have the highest incidence of asthma and the, less, the least amount of access to a medical home model for comprehensive asthma treatment. So our hope is in developing this electronic clinical decision support tool to integrate into an electronic health record that we can help support the um, following uh, evidence-based guidelines as well as increasing access and provision of more comprehensive, uh, high-quality asthma care for our patients. And the fourth strategy is to accelerate prevention efforts by identifying and testing interventions to prevent onset of asthma. By using health information technology, particularly the electronic health record, being able to report upon our patient population that has asthma and then identify our highest risk asthma patients by uh, being able to capture uh, the number of patients who are seen in the emergency department or hospitalized related to asthma, we can then start to identify and target our resources through care management and case management for more intensive services to treat and uh, do preventative services for asthma. So you may, if you attended my session yesterday, you may have seen when I talked about NCQA, patient-centered medical home standards, there's six standards uh, to um, achieve a medical home status. But if we look at building a medical home uh, in, in the asthma medical home, we want to look at those same six standards. So when we talk about access in your health center, how do your patients access services? Do you have hours that are um, accessible for your patients? So if uh, they, um, the parents uh, work or they're staying with their uh, grandmother who works the day shift, do you have evening hours or Saturday hours so that they can be seen for asthma treatment? Uh, do you have someone on call 24-7 so when the office is closed, some, there is a, a health care health care provider who is available for any questions regarding um, their children or their asthma symptoms? Do you have open access scheduling so that they don't have to wait two to three weeks to get an appointment or they don't have to come in on a walk-in basis and wait two to three hours to be seen? 
to provide services in a language that they speak and to provide written information, patient education that is low uh, literacy, or is it multimedia videos for any of your patients who cannot read? Um, so these are the, the aspects of asthma, of access that we think about when we think about treating asthma. How do you manage, do population management? Do you have the ability to do reporting on your patient population to even identify all your patients who do have asthma? And when you do that reporting, that enables you to call in all your asthma patients and identify if they haven't had their flu vaccines yet, if they haven't seen, been seen for a well visit to do uh, asthma management when they're not sick and not having an exacerbation. How are you planning and managing their care? Are you following the guidelines and assessing asthma and identifying and quantifying the severity of their asthma? Because according to the guidelines, all patients with asthma, once identified, need to have the severity of their asthma documented, whether they have intermittent asthma or persistent asthma. And we've found that in using electronic medical records, research studies have shown that there's a larger percentage of patients with asthma diagnosis who have their severity documented when using an electronic health record versus using a patient record. How are you doing medication management? How are you identifying all your patients who have persistent asthma and making sure that they're on the proper medications? Because the guidelines recommend that all patients with persistent asthma be on inhaled corticosteroids. And uh, unless you've documented the severity of their asthma, you can't identify whether or not the patients are being managed uh, with the proper medications. And patient tracking, how are you following your patients who have been seen in the emergency department or hospitalized for their asthma? How are you tracking them to make sure that they follow up at your health center to make sure that they have access to the medications that have been prescribed, that they understand their asthma action plan, that their asthma symptoms are improving? Do you have a system for uh, follow-up and tracking? And what are your quality improvement measures? Are you doing any kind of quality improvement studies to, to look at how well you are managing your asthma patients? Uh, so these are the six compo components of an asthma care home. So yesterday we talked a little bit about meaningful use of electronic medical records and when we think about using electronic medical records to uh, improve asthma care, we think about this, the, the same uh, quality issues, that we want to use the EHR and clinical decision support to improve quality and safety of our asthma patients. We want to engage our patients and families in their care using the electronic medical record and we want to improve population and public health. We want to lessen the incidence of asthma. So we want to think about those populations of patients who are at higher risk for asthma and uh, target more intensive services and resources towards them to improve their asthma uh, risk factors. So this project, uh, what we did was we uh, worked with the Alliance of Chicago, which has 32 community health centers across the country, and we evaluated their uh, current workflow and the system use, meaning their uh, electronic health record, how were they documenting patients with asthma in their electronic health record. And we recognized that they were failing to document many of the things that are recommended according to the guidelines. So we decided we were going to build an electronic clinical decision support form that incorporates the 2007 National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guideline, asthma guidelines for asthma management. Now those guidelines are about 150 pages, so what we needed to do was consolidate those down into a usable form that clinicians could use during an office visit in order to uh, take care of the asthma, pa asthma patients. That required pulling together a group of subject matter experts. So we used some pediatricians, some uh, internal medicine specialists, we used a pulmonologist, we used an informatist, a clinical informatist, and that's someone who builds electronic forms uh, for electronic health records. And uh, we worked together to develop a form, and then we trained all of the clinicians on the form and on the asthma guidelines, and we rolled that form out in September of 2012. Um, and uh, based on that, we then recently did a survey six months post uh, initial rollout uh, to evaluate the usability and effectiveness of the form. Before I talk about the results of that, I just wanted to show you some screenshots about what our form looks like. 
And this, uh, and I hope you can see because the screens are sort of far away, but this is a picture of the overall asthma care plan. For any of you who may be a nurse and uh, went through nursing training, it's all about developing care plans. And so this care plan was really based uh, on the asthma guidelines and uh, really the four areas of um, implementation that really needed to be emphasized, and that would be medication management, making sure that our patients had access to the medications, that they understood how to use medications, understood the directions for use, uh, and understood when to step up the use of their medications based on their severity. Assessment and monitoring, as I mentioned before, that it's uh, important for anyone who has been diagnosed with asthma to have the their um, severity documented, so a assessed and documented, uh, controlling environmental factors, and I will show you a screenshot of our trigger uh, evaluation and um, education form, and also engaging our patients in an asthma action plan. So if you look at this screenshot, you'll see that we have multiple tabs across the top, the summary, the questionnaire. The questionnaire is the asthma control test. I don't have a screenshot of that, but is it a five-question questionnaire, uh, and it's uh, currently in English and Spanish, that assesses a patient's control or a parent can respond for their child, the control of their asthma, so their daily symptoms of asthma. It gives you an objective score that allows you to determine whether or not their asthma is controlled during that visit. This is a tool that can be used uh, in multiple ways. Uh, the patient or family member can fill it out uh, on this. If you have a computer kiosk in your waiting room, they can fill it out there. Or some uh, health centers use an iPad that they hand to the family in the waiting room to complete the asthma control test. Uh, it can be filled out if you have a patient portal, which means they can log into a computer from any site, whether it's the library or their own personal computer, and they can remotely get into their uh, medical record and they can fill out their asthma control test there. Or the medical assistant can help the family members do it when they are brought back into the exam room and their vital signs are taken. Uh, You'll also see that um, this overall care plan shows you what needs to be done and what um, the protocol is and whether or not that's been completed. So then you see under the column of today, if, if during that visit you're going to update, you're going to do spirometry, then you can click that that's been updated that day. Now this just gives you an overall um, bird's eye view of their asthma care plan. It doesn't mean that all of these ne things need to be completed in one full visit because there's no way you can manage uh, all of this in, in a 15-minute visit. But what it shows you is the ongoing asthma care plan to manage a patient's uh, asthma over time. This is a screenshot of the asthma uh, severity tab and the control tab. And if you look at the top, you'll see that um, has, uh, the question, has the patient's asthma severity already been classified? And you say yes or no. Are they currently on a controller medication? And you document yes or, or no. Um, and then this is an assessment for you to determine once you've determined what their severity is, whether it's persistent or intermittent, you then begin to assess how well their asthma is controlled. So uh, the, this assessment involves two things. It involves looking at impairment factors um, to determine control and also risk factors. So if you'll look at the questions under impairment, you ask them, uh, do you have a cough due to your asthma? A non less than two times a week, a greater than two times a week. Do you have wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, nighttime awakening? Uh, then you can also determine lung functions if they've had spirometry. When we talk about impairment, it's looking at from their asthma, do we see um, an increased risk? Have they had more than two acute ER visits or hospitalizations? Have they required oral steroids to control their asthma? And based on both impairment and risk, it will determine whether their asthma is controlled or uh, not well controlled or poorly controlled. And that helps you determine their severity and their control, which leads to clinical decision support. This is a screenshot of the trigger assessment that we developed. And if you look, before you go down through all the different triggers, uh, the first thing you always want to ask is smoking status. Are they an active cigarette smoker? Part of meaningful use of electronic health records requires that you inquire on smoking status and document smoking status of all patients from 12 and up, age 12 and up. 
uh, we, you also want to ask if they've had passive smoke exposure. And, uh, and we know that now that there are risk factors associated with secondhand as well as thirdhand smoke. And then you can document whether you've advised them to uh, quit and whether or not you've provided any resources. We also made, thought it was important to collect demographic information on housing status, so if they're located in public housing, if they're uh, living in shelters, if they're currently homeless, because that will help with uh, reporting as we, if we begin to see that there's a large proportion of our asthma patients who live in public housing, we then run a report on the um, zip code and we may identify that there's a big environmental risk issue uh, in a particular public housing community and and that gives us actual data to go to the public housing community and uh, speak to the people at HUD and say we need to work jointly on some uh, environmental remediation. Perhaps there is a rodent or roach problem uh, that is rampant through the community, a big problem in Philadelphia public housing. Um, also. Uh, or mold problems. Uh, so we thought it was very important to collect housing status. Uh, and then if you look at allergies, you'll see that we uh, looked at some of the key triggers that have been identified uh, through research in a document called Clearing the Air uh, that have uh, been documented as asthma uh, indoor air, uh, air quality triggers. So things like dust mites, pollen cut gr grass and flowers, animals, um, mice, rats, cockroaches, indoor mold. We also looked at irritants, tobacco smoke, outdoor pollution. I know pollution can be a huge problem in places like Los Angeles as well as in cities like Denver. Uh, wood smoke, chalk dust, cleaning products. We also left some blank drop down boxes so you could write in if there was a particular trigger uh, that the patient has identified. <clears throat> and then not only do we document whether or not they have that exposure, we document whether they've had any kind of allergy testing related to that. So there's skin testing where you can identify whether they have a specific uh, cockroach allergy uh, and any kind of uh, comments. So if they happen to have a pet, um, you can document in the blank space whether or not you know they have a pet, uh, whether they have a problem with a lot of feral cats in the community. Uh, so this gives us some, um, some data to really look at a targeted uh, education. Um, it also gives us some information that can be used by the community health worker to go out to do uh, home visits to look at environmental triggers and provide some, uh, some training and education on remediation. And uh, at that time, we also reassess any kind of allergies to make sure that we don't um, miss any kind of other allergies. So based on all that information that we're able to collect, this form us uh, to have some uh, behind-the-scenes clinical decision support because once you've documented the severity of their asthma, whether they're controlled or not controlled, you look at that you've assessed their inhaler technique, whether they're, um, it's correct or incorrect, whether they've the adherence to their medication, because it may be that the parent lost their job, no longer has health, health insurance, and therefore cannot access the inhaled corticosteroid that is used to control their asthma. And just a side note that the average price of an inhaled corticosteroid, even if it's generic, runs somewhere between $100 to $110 per inhaler. So if you need that every month, that is a huge uh, piece of one's income. And when we talked about the average person who is uh, trying to pay for healthy housing in rent, uh, who pays well over 30% of their income, and then we're asking them to pay an additional $110 a month just to control their asthma, you know what usually goes, and that is accessing medication. So this gives us an, um, an opportunity to address inhaler technique, to address adherence, and and then to document why there may be some issues related to adherence. Again, in being able to capture this information, it gives us um, some data to say we need to pull in the patient navigator to help this, pa this person complete an application for the pa uh, pharmacy assistance program. Or this is someone that, if we're lucky enough to be in a health center that gets uh, pharmaceutical uh, samples, that we should make sure we collect some uh, samples so that we can provide samples for our patients. 
And then also, have you already assessed environmental control? Is it adequate or inadequate? So based on that, as well as once you've uh, determined the severity of their asthma, uh, their impairment and risk, uh, the clinical decision support sort of behind the scenes uh, calculates what their uh, what's the status of their asthma. So in this case, this, this patient has uh, moderate persistent asthma, and it recommends the treatment plan, which is step three of medication management. Now, for anyone who's a clinical provider, this stepwise treatment plan should not be unfamiliar because this was released in the guidelines. And actually, the, um, the medication management piece is uh, very similar to earlier guidelines. So for someone with moderate, persistent, uncontrolled asthma, a step three means a, a higher intervention of a controller medication along with a rescue inhaler. Now, this clinical decision support tool doesn't does allow you to change what they recommend because if you say, you know what, actually, I don't really think they need step three. I really think they're fine on step two. The reason why they're so uncontrolled is because they haven't had access to their medication for the last month. So it gives the clinician the ultimate decision whether or not to go with the recommendation or change it, but at least it provides some guidance on where to start. The next form is a recommendation on available medications. Uh, it reviews what their current problem list is, what their other medications may be. It also will list their allergies. So when uh, prescribing medication, you have access right then and there on that page of all the other medications they're taking and if they have any kind of allergy. And then they'll give you recommendations for a quick release uh, um, or quick relief or what we call a rescue inhaler. So usually that's your albuterol or a Ventolin inhaler. Uh, and then a long-term controller medication. So if they have persistent, medica uh, persistent asthma documented as the f their severity, you want to make sure that that patient is on an inhaled corticosteroid inhaler. So this is the place where the patient engagement and patient uh, education steps in, and this is the asthma action plan. For anyone who works with patients who have asthma, the guidelines recommend that all patients with a diagnosis of, of asthma have an asthma plan. The asthma action plan has really been set up kind of like a stoplight, so green means they're good, their asthma is well controlled. When their asthma is controlled, this is what they do, uh, and the, the medication is pulled in from earlier uh, parts of the visit so that you don't have to um, determine that. That'll be pulled in if you've already put them on a rescue inhaler. Uh, and then it reviews things like avoid tobacco smoke, ask people to smoke outside, uh, make sure your pet doesn't sleep in the bedroom. And it also instructs what's happening if you're starting to see some decrease in control of your asthma. So if you're continuing to, if you're starting to experiencing um, some cough, some wheezing, some chest tightness, it gives direction on what to do if you're starting to get into trouble so that the patient and family members have some information about how to step up their medication management. It gives them a little control, also makes them feel like they have some ability to uh, manage their medication on their own without having to call uh, and access the health care provider. And then, of course, there's the red zone, when they're really getting into trouble, what that looks like, what they need to do, and uh, when to call 911. The Asthma Action Plan can be a real tool for what we call health information exchange because we can share that Asthma Action Plan electronically um, from the primary care provider to the school nurse, to the camp, to the daycare provider, to grandma's house if she watches the grandchildren. Uh, it can be shared to, with the specialist. So everybody's on the same page as to what the asthma action plan is. Many of the uh, patients really love having it, and they keep it either in a, uh, a medical file at home. Sometimes they keep it hanging on the refrigerator so they know what to do uh, and how to manage their child's um, asthma. It, again, gives them information that they understand uh, one of the things I would really recommend is when you sit down and you uh, you develop the asthma action plan, it should be done in collaboration with the patient. You don't hand it to them and say, this is what you have to do. You walk through each step and you say, you know, if you're experiencing this, this is what's going to help. And after, do you understand this? Is it clear for you? And what... I recommend is always stopping at that moment saying, is there anything that we talked about in this plan that's unclear? And is there anything in this plan that would be difficult for you to do? So 
if I tell you that you're in the red zone and you should call 911 and I say, is there anything difficult for you to do? And you say, well, I don't have a phone. Then we need to sort of rethink about, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that if you're in an emergency that you can access care? And maybe part of that plan is you go next door to your neighbor who you know has a landline phone to call. Um, so that, again, is engaging the patient in their care, making sure they understand the plan, giving them a sense of control is putting the patient in the center. Because as I said yesterday at my workshop, patients are the most important part of the healthcare system and they're a very uh, valuable resource that we often leave out of the equation and we need to pull them back in in order to provide more effective, safer, higher quality care. So what are the expected outcomes of integrating this tool? So far, we've integrated into 32 community health centers across the country. As I said, we uh, have rolled it out. It's been out about seven months. We did a usability survey, and the feedback we got was that the clinicians thought it was very thorough. It helped them follow the guidelines, but they were overwhelmed by the uh, enormity of the form, that there's seven different tabs that they felt like, did they need to complete the entire form from start to finish within a 15-minute visit, who did all the check boxes, uh, who was responsible for making sure the form was completed. And so not only do you look at usability of a form, meaning is it implicity, is there good workflow, is the font a readable size, does it make sense, do you read from left to right, would you rather have button tabs or drop-down boxes? Um, does it support the evidence-based guidelines? So we we got thumbs up on all of the usability piece, but we uh, what we discovered is that you can develop a really great tool, but if you don't train people on how to use it, it's a tool that's just going to sit in the toolbox and and gather dust. So our next step is to develop an implementation guideline on how to use the tool within the workflow of your clinic practice. Every clinic's a little bit different, and you perhaps gone to other workshops throughout this conference that talked about building a team for healthcare delivery. So we have developed this tool and we've divided it into tabs so that different members of the team can, can complete different parts of the form. So the asthma trigger form does not have to be completed by the physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant. It could be completed by the, the uh, nurse educator, the asthma educator. It could be completed by the community health worker or the medical assistant. The asthma care plan can be completed by the medical assistant or maybe the nurse a chronic care manager. So there's different portions of the form that can be completed by different parts of the team and at different times. But health centers are sort of struggling with what that looks like during an office visit. So we've decided we needed to develop an implementation framework. And we're going to use a model from the Office of the National Coordinator on Clinical Decision Support and rework that in order to develop that framework. And then we will go back out to those 32 health centers and train them on how to implement this form. So next steps is reporting. Reporting will enable us to uh, look at how well clinicians follow the guidelines once they have clini clinical decision support to help them adhere to guidelines. So we can begin to look at quality measure reports to say what percentage of your asthma patients have an asthma action plan because that's part of the guidelines. And because we've captured that data, we now can easily report upon it. What percentage of your asthma patients have their asthma severity documented? What percentage of your asthma patients have persistent asthma that are on inhaled corticosteroids? Uh, and what percentage have environmental trigger screening? When you start looking at those percentages and you find that perhaps you're not doing such a very good job at uh, environmental trigger screening, that is a quality improvement project where you start to look at, okay, how do we integrate more environmental trigger screening into our uh, work plan and what member of the healthcare team do we pull in to help support that process? So it also is a tool that can really help you with your quality improvement measures. What is our uh, hope for outcomes, long-term outcome, is to improve quality and safety of uh, our asthma patients. Uh, it's uh, hopefully over time, long-term measures over several years, we can start to look at since we've implemented this tool, do we see a decrease in the number of emergency department visits and the number of missed school days and improvement in the asthma control test, which assesses for asthma control. 
So it enables us to really look at not only short-term short outcomes, but also long-term outcomes. So some of our future plans with this project is to develop patient-centric tools to support self-management and promote engagement with clinicians using technology. Uh, there are some programs now. There's uh, some really neat um, there's a, an app for a smartphone called Assist Me with Inhalers. If you uh, download it, it is an auditory application that uh, you can um, set it up so that it uh, sets an alarm to prompt you to take your controller medication every day, and then it also walks you through with an actual video of how to take your inhaler and also counts off the 10 seconds that you need to hold your breath. It actually counts off the 10 seconds. So once you inhale, it'll count down the 10 seconds, and then it counts 30 seconds for you to wait before you take the second puff. So it's wonderful for anyone who's vision impaired, who has low health literacy, but really anyone in general who needs to be reminded about inhaler technique, and it will prompt them to use the controller inhaler. There's an, um, another a technology called uh, Asmopolis, which is um, you can put it on the rescue inhaler and it captures, it's, it's a form of geomapping, so uh, it captures data for time of day and location of when you use the inhaler and then that information uh, can be downloaded into the uh, patient's emergency. Uh, electronic medical record, and then we can begin to look at uh, when you need your rescue inhaler, where are you and what time of day is it, so we can start to look at, you know, when you're at school, you're having a lot of asthma attacks. Is there something at school that's really triggering your asthma? And again, it allows us to then partner with some other community resources like the school-based nurse uh, talk, and also some other environmental resources to help with uh, remediation of environmental triggers. So it's really a way to engage other partners by having this kind of data uh, to say this is a real issue. Uh, we can help manage the asthma in the home, but we need additional, you know, additional partners to look at asthma. Asthma is, is, you know, it's an environmental issue. There's lots of uh, resources and uh, factors that are involved. So there's some really exciting technology that's coming down the pipe. Um, again, I mentioned a patient portal and personal health record. There are some patient portals that allow patients to record what we call observations of daily living so that they can get on and, and track their own asthma record and asthma control. Uh, again, it's another way of engaging patients into their care and feeling like they have a little control because when you have a chronic illness, uh, it's not uncommon for patients to feel um, like they don't have control. And so this is a way to pull them back in to the, to the part of the healthcare team to help them manage their disease. So that uh, is just a demonstration of how we use uh, health information technology and clinical decision support to improve asthma management. Uh, again, I said I'm from the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. Another part of this grant was to develop a training and curriculum for clinicians to treat asthma. And so we have uh, free training available, web-based as well as live training. Uh, and I have some... Um, promotional uh, information about that. If you're interested in picking that up and bringing it back to your health center, we have a CECME training available on our website that's free and you just need to click the link and listen in. It's an hour-long webinar. Uh, we do have training for community health workers in both English and Spanish and we've developed a comprehensive asthma resource list located on our website that uh, you can access that has uh, patient education, multimedia so video as well as low health literacy in multiple, multiple languages. Uh, so we have some Farsi, we have different uh, Asian languages, um, we have some resources from, for some really great um, video related education that you can put in your health center, that you can play on your computer in the exam room while the patient's waiting to be seen. We also have some policy papers and research, research uh, and other CME related uh, resources on our asthma resource list. So I, I would encourage you to go to our website at www.clinicians.org, hit uh, asthma, and uh, you'll see the link for our asthma resource list. 
Here's our information. These slides, I believe, will be available to you on the National Center for Health and Public Housing website, so you can always refer to that, uh, and we'd be happy if you contacted us if you needed further information. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, with the just for the so that's a really good question. The question was, was the form, the electronic clinical decision support, created just for the 32 health centers? Uh, I will tell you that the vendor that they use is GE Centricity. That's the EHR platform. And we are currently... Um, getting ready to disseminate that and share that with other GE Centricity users. So we're going to start the rollout by um, sharing that content with other health center networks who use GE Centricity and then be uh, and, and it's easier to do that because they speak the same language. And so all the code that's written in those forms are the code of uh, GE Centricity. Uh, the form, because it's a federally uh, funded development, is uh, free and available. Uh, once we've rolled that out to other self health centers to see how well that's integrated, uh, we will be able to share it with other vendors, so other EHR vendors. They can't just pull that form into their uh, EHR because they use a different code, uh, but they can use screenshots and templates to write write the form in their own code and integrate it. So um, that is one of the challenges, and uh, you know, one of the stumbling box, blocks with health information exchanges is, is when you have multiple vendors, uh, they can't always share the same, they don't share the same language and code, but they can at least look at the format to develop this themselves. And as I said yesterday, if you attended my session, is one of uh, the struggles of adopting electronic health records is that the, the vendors have developed the software often without really good input from clinician users as well as patient users. So this is a form that we have used subject matter experts. We've rolled it out. We've gotten patient feedback. We've gotten provider feedback. So this would be a, a form that um, we would wish that vendors would develop all their forms that way. Um, so hopefully this be can, can become a model of form development for many other uh, chronic illness management as well as preventive health management. Uh, so it's just the beginning, but hopefully um, the, the more traction we get, we've submitted abstracts to a lot of larger uh, health informatics type meetings to uh, share this information. We've also shared it with the CDC who's very interested in this. So um, obviously because uh, we're dependent on funding and since funding is a little um, limited and, and maybe even more so limited uh, come the end of this fiscal year, um, we're hoping that we can get continued funding for larger dissemination. Any other questions? Yeah, I, got, I got three questions. Okay. I hope I can answer them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I have three questions. You can probably tell I got kind of excited here about your iPhone apps that, you know, give everything and then have a means to really get it together. One thing, one thing that popped in my head was uh, one of the biggest struggles for us is to get your own real world or whatever. It says on the box, this has got 200 bucks. And unless you get a pen out, every time you do a little ticket mark, you got no way of knowing how far down you want to be trying you know, and that's rough if you're like three weeks into a bad episode. So I wonder if you little does that little app track up count. Okay. That's the first question. You know, I I don't know. Uh, I haven't actually seen um the application of the Asmopolis, that's the geomapping one we're talking about. And in fact, um, our intent with this project is to approach them. Uh, I know they're doing some work in other health centers where they're supplying it to uh, the health centers to provide to their patients with asthma. Um, and so we, we're looking for a foundational grant to do that. Um, so I would encourage you actually to uh, Google Asmopolis and uh, see if you can actually find that information out and then I will certainly do the same in case I have future questions from other uh, attendees. I will do so. Thank you. Uh, the next two questions are purely self-serving. I'll present them to the CEUs. These are the questions on the 
example. I didn't, I don't know if I quite got the answer, please. What is, which is a validated screening tool to assess asthma control? Of the choices I see, it's looking like maybe it's the ACT. Yes, the asthma control test, the ACT. Okay. Incorrect. Um, bleach can be a really, um, uh, it can be a huge asthma irritant, and um, the best solution for uh, elimination of mold is elbow grease. Is really just scrubbing with soap and water. Believe it or not, um, if you've ever, you know, the dreaded um, caulking between the tile, uh, you got to get that scrub brush. And I often, believe it or not, just use. Um, uh, dishwashing liquid and water and uh, all the research studies show and the environment you know EPA recommends that it's really to get rid of mold is elbow grease Thank you very much. you're welcome yes Say, assist me with inhalers. Yes, you got it. If you have a smartphone, you can download it right now as we speak. If you have avail you should have Wi-Fi availability. Uh, it is the greatest app because it's really accessible for all. I was very excited about it, uh, and I'm looking forward to the development of more uh, really usable uh, patient apps. And just a note about uh, smartphone use: we often think that. Um, that there are not as many people, low-income users of smartphones, but in fact, uh, they are one of the larger group of smartphone users because often it's their only access to the Internet uh, rather than uh, most of them do not have a desktop computer or a laptop but use a smartphone to access, um, to, uh, access the Internet. So um, the app development can be really a wonderful opportunity for patient education and patient engagement. Yes? Well, they had an old form, an old asthma form bef that was developed that came that was developed uh, in the GE system. Um, Bef and it was older because it, it was rolled out before the 2007 guidelines. And when they ran reports on the use of that particular form, the use of it was less than 1%. So then when we did this six-month rollout, and you have to think about the fact that in six months, over 32 health centers and the percentage of asthma patients they may have, maybe they might have only seen maybe 25% of their asthma patients, right? And they may have only seen them once. And maybe when they saw them, they came in for uh, hypertension, diabetes. And um, so what we did see in the six months uh, that the use of this new asthma form jumped up to about anywhere from 11 to 13%, which is still not high, but it's miles better than less than 1%. And um, so it's only been six months. And so maybe, you know, of all the cl clinician users, maybe they didn't see some of their asthma patients yet in that six-month period of time. Um, and so that reporting will be repeated. But what we realized from the, the survey is that um, we really need to go back in and uh, teach them how to use the form. The other piece was we learned that a lot of clinicians – um, didn't quite understand the guidelines, so they didn't know, well, what's the difference between me documenting severity versus control, and do I have to do both? And the issue is you only document severity one time, and every subsequent visit you're assessing control. Um, so how well are you managing that asthma? It's rare that the severity actually changes. Unless it's a child that kind of outgrows their asthma, then they may go from a persistent asthmatic to maybe... Uh, as they get a little older, intermittent. But uh, once you've documented a severity, you don't have to reassess that at subsequent visits. And so some clinicians didn't really understand the guidelines well enough, so they felt like they had to do that form twice to do both severity and control. So that told us that, A, they need a little more training on the guidelines, and they also needed a little bit more training on how to actually use the form. Well, yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, you know, um, when you're talking about um, the safety net population, it depends on uh, the insurance status of your patient population and whether or not... Um, you know, certain Medicaid managed care plans will cover it and others will not. So um, certainly, uh, I know as a clinician provider myself, it, you know, if it's covered, it, it's um, a helpful tool, especially if you know that that patient will not get to a specialist to do the skin test because in order to have your skin tested, it is a allergist specialist visit. And sometimes even accessing that um, or finding an allergist that accepts Medicaid, managed care, um, and certainly if they're uninsured, you know, forget about it. Uh, but, I mean, I've used it myself when um, I've known that, that that's a tool that will help. I mean, the gold standard is still skin testing. Yeah, it <laughs> Right. Right. The only tricky thing is sometimes uh, with the immunocap, when it comes back with some of those food allergies, you don't know how severe unless they've had a severe reaction where you say, okay, you are clearly allergic to milk and you, you know, it's not just an intolerance or you're clearly allergic to wheat. Uh, if it comes back positive, but you don't, and the, you know, oftentimes you still end up needing to send them to an allergist to determine what the action plan is for can they still eat it. Um, and so it, it sometimes still will necessitate a specialist visit. Well, thank you so much for staying and listening. I know at the end of a long uh, week of conference, sometimes it's hard, hard to go to the very last session. I hope I provided you with some helpful information. I do have some information not only on our asthma resources, but as well as we have a... Um, and I would encourage you to look at this, is we have a tobacco-free website through the ACU website that was developed for special populations. So there's resources targeted towards um, um, pregnant Latino women. There's also one for HIV-positive patients, for um, African Americans. So there's resources specific. Uh, and it was really developed in um, with the um, intention for resources and sp support specific to the safety net. So I have some cards and resources I'll bring them down to the table. I encourage you to collect them. And again, thank you very much for your time and attention.